feast of the ting. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Liberators Podcast. Today we have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Jason Edward Tucker II, who is a native of Baltimore, Maryland. He is currently a family resident, family medicine resident in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Dr. Tucker credits his path thus far to his family, who not only consist of his parents and his two younger sisters, but also to his two sets of grandparents and over 30 first cousins, many of whom have served as a guide for him as he continues to navigate the medical field and leave his mark on the next generation. He is a graduate of St. Paul's School for Boys, an independent K-12 institution in Brooklynville, Maryland. There he was an IB diploma candidate and two sport athlete heavily involved in the school's basketball and volleyball programs. During his time at St. Paul's, he was also president of the Black Awareness Club, an organization that served as both an outlet and safe haven for minorities and a predominantly, at a predominantly white institution. As an athlete at St. Paul's, he was a member of two MIAA championship volleyball teams and an all-conference basketball player. At the culmination of his time at St. Paul's, he was awarded the Martin D. Tulia Head Coaches Cup Award, presented to the individual who is both an excellent athlete and outstanding student, whose character and integrity exemplifies the philosophy and spirit of St. Paul's. He received his bachelor's in science from Xavier University of Louisiana, where he graduated magna cum laude with honors in chemistry and philosophy. During Dr. Tucker's time at Xavier, he became a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Attorney Incorporated, and he was an executive board member of both Collegiate 100 and Minority Association of Pre-Health Students, while also serving as a student mentor under Project Be There. It was at Xavier that his inclination towards the medical field blossomed. As a student, he accumulated hundreds of hours as a hospital volunteer and participated in the summer medical and dental education program at Howard University and the research education experience for undergraduates at John Hopkins University in the Institute of Nanobiotechnology. Dr. Tucker credits Xavier for having an immense impact on his life's trajectory. Dr. Tucker then graduated from Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. At MSM, he served as a student ambassador, a member of the Student Coalition for Equality and Vice President of Morehouse's Student National Medical Association chapter. He conducted research through Kaiser Permanente, which ultimately led to a publication on bilateral quadriceps tendon repairs with suture anchors in the Permanente Journal. At Morehouse, Dr. Tucker discovered his love for family medicine and primary care. His passions include sports medicine and advocacy in relation to health equity. He is particularly interested in the connection between athletics and the opportunities for mentorship of underrepresented minorities in medicine. Please join me and welcome in our guest for today, my brother, Dr. Jason Edward Tucker II. How you doing, man? I'm all right, man. It's good to be here. Absolutely. You know, this has been a, been a long time coming. Yeah, this has been uh, in the making for a while. <laughs> Had to put if that you know, doctor you know, on his man. name. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's Absolutely. true. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, today we'll be talking about using a love for sports as a catalyst for a medical career. Um, tell us a little bit more about, I know I read the bio, um, but tell us a little bit more about yourself and your journey to becoming uh, a first year resident. Yeah. Um, so, you know, what's interesting is when you were reading the bio, uh, the part that really stuck out to me was the first, you know, the initial paragraph where I talked about my family, because without them, I don't think I would be in the position I'm at right now. Um, mm -hmm. You know, coming from a really large family, I am one of the prescribers to the notion that it really takes a village. Um, so, you know, from day one, they've been in my corner from, you know, whatever I said I was interested in or passionate in, they've been kind of driving me and pushing me um, in order to excel in those things. So really, when I talk about my journey in medicine, it starts with them. My, uh, my great grandmother, she was the midwife in Louisiana. And you know, she birthed so many babies at that time. And, you know, my grandfather tells me stories of, you know, him running with, uh, taking his bike with birth certificates down, uh, you know, to the uh, the center down there, like in, in their town and whatnot. But those roots in medicine, they really start from my family and my origins. So, you know, 
coming up in Baltimore, you obviously see a large social inequity in the city as well. So that's mm-hmm. kind of also what stimulates my uh, my path in terms of wanting to increase underrepresented minorities in medicine, because I've seen people who struggle with social determinants of health, uh, who come from similar backgrounds like myself, and there's really not a lot of difference in myself and those individuals. So, you know, it's really my background that has drawn me to where I'm at in medicine right now. And that's been consistent from being in Baltimore to going to New Orleans to then Atlanta and now Philadelphia, very different cities, but cities that, you know, have similar needs in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what continues to draw me to those places. Um, So obviously you read my bio, people know, you know, the steps that I've taken to get where I'm at right now. But I think all of that really starts with day one, uh, my family, and just the uh, the stepping stones, if you will, you know, the, the shoulders of the giants that I stand on in my own family. Mm-hmm. And what what components of a family like that, family support, what does it look like? Because sometimes it's different for every person. You know, sometimes it's, de- it's them being there from a resource standpoint. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's them being there for motivation, inspiration. Other times it's you know, sending money, you know, so yeah. Um, in, in what capacity would you say had the most impact on, on you feeling like, okay, this is, this is what, this is what my family gave me that gave me a better chance to succeed. Yeah. I think that one of the biggest things you touched on a little bit is motivation, right? Mm-hmm. So for example, I don't have any older brothers, but I have older cousins who served as brothers to me, you know, and seeing them come up and seeing their successes and their mistakes, you know, kind of paved the way for me because, you know, I was, you know, I run things by them. I talk to them, whether it be medicine or just life. And, you know, sometimes they, for the right reasons, get on me when need be, you know, uh, and there's tough love there in a sense. And then other times, you know, they're, you know, my biggest supporters as well. Um, so that comes from them. And that's, you know, similar to my parents as well. Uh, grew up in a household where you know there were definitely expectations of how you would act in the outside world and a lot of that comes from trying to navigate and raise a black male in the world that we live in Mm -hmm. um so you know there comes a lot of lessons that need to be had and things that need to be taught from a young age on how you conduct yourself in certain areas for one survival but then two to you know continue to make it on a day-to-day basis so having people in my corner that understood those things already, I think played a big part in my success and how I navigate to this day. So what, what were some of those lessons that they, that they taught you as a black male to be able to thrive yeah. within society? Yeah. I think that a lot of people have heard like that old adage that, you know, as African-Americans, you have to be twice as good, you know, just to it's get true. like half as far. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, we, we've heard that. Right. But I think that it really comes down to very, like, small things that I was taught from a young age, just in terms of, like, how to think about myself and how to see myself as uh, in a positive light. Because I feel like we grow up with so many negative examples of people that look like us, um, which is a deeper discussion that we can definitely get into uh, in terms of how people are portrayed in the media and, you know, what we think is reality versus what's actually going on. Um, But, you know, it comes with presenting yourself in a certain way so I can always remember like my mom she was real intent on look whenever you go in this store you take your hood off you take your hat off and you let people see your face and things like that you look people in the eye when you talk to them um and you speak with a purpose you know when you when you speak it should be purposeful um and then when you're not speaking you should be intently listening to what others are saying so you know you show people that you have interest in them and they'll have interest in you as well So it's just very little things that I feel like come with how to navigate a conversation because, you know, for me, I feel like I can talk to almost anyone and that's something I pride myself on. That's what I think makes me a good family doctor as well. So those lessons that, you know, were subconsciously being taught to me at a young age, I think that those really play a part in my day-to-day interactions right now, whether it be medically or whether it just be socially. Absolutely. And that's something that like my dad taught us as well, which was, to be quick to listen, slow to speak, you know, that was, the, you know, that, that was, that was his, what he used to tell us all the time, because sometimes he was like, you're listening to respond, not to listen, you know, (laughs) so it's like, you know, take your time to to digest what a person is telling you. 
Yeah, yeah. And I think that, you know, sometimes we think the loudest person in the room is the smartest person. And at least in my experience, often that's not true. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I think sometimes like people that talk a lot or feel the need to be the loudest, it's it's an insecurity there. So they're like, yeah. oh, well, let me get in front of it <laughs> exactly. you know, and, and, exactly. and say the most. But what I learned is that I learned way more from being quiet than I learned mm-hmm. from talking. You know what I yeah. mean? For me being quiet, I can think, OK, this is what he's trying to say. This is what he's about. Because people love to tell you about themselves, you know. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, my my dad always says when people show you who they are, believe them. You know. Believe them. So you get yeah, you get a chance to see who people are when you just sit back and you know analyze. Um, Mm -hmm. and I know we've talked about this before, but uh, it's interesting when you get in a group of people. If you just take a step back and kind of you know look at the interactions, you can tell a lot about what's going on in the room by people's mannerisms and by the way that they carry themselves in conversations without even, you know, actually speaking to them, just by taking a step back and looking and observing what's going on. Right. It'd it be, it's, you know, it's the, it's the vibe a lot of the times. It's the energy that a person portrays. And if a person never really says anything to you, you don't know how to gauge them, really. Right. You know, it right. becomes more and more difficult to gauge. So, you know, I, I had to learn that early on is to, is to stand back and, and observe. The question that I do want to ask you, Mm-hmm. as a physician when you're having those conversations do you go in telling them that you're a physician or do you wait until you learn who that person is to tell them what you do because in my experience by me telling someone I'm in medical school their personality changes mm-hmm. they, they start to interact with me based on more so what I do versus who I am as a person yeah. You know, so have have you had yeah. that same experience? Yeah, I think so. Um, definitely as a medical student, because what's interesting is, uh, and I think that people that are in professional schools can kind of uh, understand where I'm coming from on this. A lot of times, like, that becomes your identity in a way to some mm-hmm. people. And, like, that's your primary identification. Like, you know, I, right now I am a medical student. I am a law student. And, you know, like, that's how you kind of try to carry yourself. Right. Um, but when you get in interactions with others, you're right. You know, when you tell them what field you're in, sometimes people, they don't switch up. But when you, you know, when you know who you're speaking with, sometimes you carry yourself differently. And I think that's mm-hmm. just human nature. Right. So you pose an interesting question. And I think that my answer is really it depends. Right. So at in some professional settings, yeah, I will let people know who I am and whatnot. Um, but also if someone that doesn't, quote unquote, look like a physician. Um, sometimes <laughs> I just kind of ride that one out and I see, you know, well, Hey, like, I just want to have an interaction with you and see how you treat me. And then based on that, I'll let you know who I am and, you know, where I come from, what I do at that point. Um, cause I do think it's a good way to kind of gauge people. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. Like when you walk in a room, you know, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, carrying yourself the right way. You never know who you're talking to. You never know yeah, who's absolutely. in the room absolutely. Um, at all times. And you, absolutely. you'd be very surprised by that as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. definitely um okay kind of to talk to go more into uh your life and what became your passion and your interest I know you spoke previously about um your grandmother being a midwife um but mm-hmm. when for you specifically did you know that you wanted to become a physician yeah um you know in, in elementary school I was always like really interested in sciences um and I think that was because science had an answer to questions. And my thing was always like, okay, how do I find out the answer? Like, you know, what's next? Uh, Cause I was, you know, just so interested in learning at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, but to be completely honest with you, uh, when I was in the sixth grade, my grandmother, she actually suffered from a stroke. And I remember that very vividly because we were about to go out for my dad's birthday and my grandfather called us and he was, you know, saying that something was wrong. And I remember going to, the uh her house and I remember seeing the ambulance come and take her to the hospital and things like that and in my mind when we got to the hospital you know I've never seen so many of my family on edge at the same time uh and for a young kid like that's something that really sticks with you and then I also remember when the physician came out to kind of update the family there was a sense of ease in that moment and I was like wow like that's what I want to do 
you know, because there were so many questions that we needed an answer to and no one could provide them. And then this one person came out and, you know, whether the news be good, bad, or in between, there was then an answer, you know, and I think that I found comfort in that. So, you know, that was, if you had to ask me for like a moment when I knew, I think that was a moment when I knew, but I, you know, and I used my inclination toward the sciences to kind of guide me in that direction. Plus I wanted to be in a space where I could communicate with people. I feel like one of my friends is communication. Mm -hmm. So I felt like it was a really good combination of those things coming together. Okay. And you just kind of kept developing on that interest, you know, cause I think yeah. like a lot of times people have this one event, but mm -hmm. they're not willing to do the work necessary to nurture that interest over time. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, you could be interested in medicine and stuff like that, but if you don't put in the work or of going to medical school, undergrad even, you know, and, yeah. and, and making sure that, you know, you're focused on what it takes to live out that passion, most people never end up living out that passion, honestly. No, oh, I, I agree with you. And I'll take it one step back a little bit, um, even if, you know, just to finish high school, to be honest mm -hmm. with you, right? Like, I feel like a lot of us get deterred, whether it be, you know, uh, a teacher that tells you, oh, well, I don't know if you can, you know, if that's for you, or, you know, you don't have the right people in your life to keep you motivated. I feel like those, that that's huge for me, man. Like, that's one of the reasons I'm so big in the mentorship is because it really makes a difference, right? So like, for example, um, someone told this to me and I never forgot it, right? So like when you look at a picture, like if we were all to take a picture, like, you know, four or five of us, what's the first thing you're going to look at when you like see the picture? Your face. Yeah. You're going to look for yourself, right? Yeah. So you, people automatically look for themselves in other moments. So you look for people that look like you, you know, mm -hmm. so to see someone that looks like you doing this and telling you, hey, you can do this too, it, it changes your whole mentality about how you approach things. So just to have people in your corner for you to, to help you graduate high school to keep you on track when you're in college. A lot of people get deterred when they get to college and you get the whole look to your left, look to your right. One of these people won't be here at the end of the day. You know, um, people get that all the time. So when you have someone that's in your corner backing you, telling you that you can get through this and you can make it to the next step and make the world feel a difference. Mm -hmm. Cause I know like that was one, that was one of my mom's stipulations. You know, she was, you know, you don't have to, go to school to be no doctor or whatever but you're gonna finish high school like, <laughs> mm -hmm, exactly. like, like that, yeah. that's yeah. for sure <laughs> you yeah know, it's um, a big thing man it is and i think we we take it for granted sometimes right yeah. um but everybody's situation is not the same so as hard as it may have been for you to finish undergrad it might have been just as hard or harder for someone to finish high school like mm -hmm. there's there's a whole plethora of things that could be going on in the background that you don't even see on a surface level so like, you know, that encouragement and like motivating people, I think that starts from day one and you can't let up on that, right? Because if you mm -hmm. are, and I feel like you, you know, you're failing those who you owe something to. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that we just take education, the ability to be educated for granted, really. Mm -hmm. You know, when educate, education really, you know, like Malcolm H said, education is the passport to the future, you know, and really- yeah. It is, you know what I mean? Um, and the reason why I say that is because through being educated, the exposure that you gain to a world mm -hmm. that's different than what you grew up in is, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's, that's the most wild. valuable thing, you know? Because yeah. I, I look at I where remember. I've... Mm -hmm, go ahead. I was just saying, I, I agree with you, right? So, like, I remember when in high school, you know, obviously I went to... A, a very good high school has a great reputation and I enjoyed my time there, right? Shout out to um, the IB program. Yeah, shout out to the <laughs> IB program. Uh, we were very well educated there. But I remember, like, seriously, when I got to Xavier, it was a whole different world, man. And it, was, it wasn't just because I was in, you know, Louisiana now, which is obviously a lot different than Baltimore and whatnot. Um, but it was because I was, for the first time, introduced to people that came from all over. You know, like one of my best friends from California, um my fiance from milwaukee like mm -hmm. you know you meet people that are just from all over and you get exposed to so many different ideas and so many different ways of thinking and you realize that while like we can have the same beliefs but we can have totally different directions in which we got to those beliefs or how we choose to fulfill them at the same time 
Um, so just like you said, it opens your whole world. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and something that you were that you were talking about, you know, of like everybody not making it because they don't have that support system sometimes. I remember when we first got to Xavier and Dr. Francis was speaking to everybody in the auditorium and he was like, you know, based on statistics, you look to your left, look to your right. <laughs> One of y'all not going to be here. And I'm mm-hmm. saying to myself, like, don't look at me. Because <laughs> I, I know I'm getting out of here. Uh, and, and it's actually so strange because, you know, the, the two people that was on side of me, Mara and Alea, we all mm-hmm. graduated, you know? Mm-hmm. So it, it goes back to having that community. But me and you both know what it was like after that first semester in the mics, watching yeah. everybody slowly disappear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a crazy I think- thing. Yeah, it's an unfortunate reality that that will happen. And it's not to say that just because it doesn't work out for you one place, it won't work out for you at another place. Um, Absolutely. But I will tell you that one of the things I've always appreciated about Xavier was that, you know, I remember in freshman uh, bio lab class, we had a a decent size class. And Mm -hmm. you're right, you hear that mantra so much about look to your left, look to your right, one of these people won't be here. Well, in this class, like the professor was like, you know, look to your left, look to your right. These are your colleagues, so get to know them well, you Mm -hmm. know? So it was like that mindset was different. Um, And it just made you feel like, look, I'm gonna make it through here. Even if, you know, I remember going to (laughs) the pre-med office and getting scolded for not applying to certain things and you know, not doing what I, yeah, not doing what I needed to be doing. Shout out to Miss QV, you know? Um, but just to have somebody that was like, look, you're going to be serious about this or you're going to play around with this. I'm like, all right, I'm going to be serious about it. You know, um, it, it makes a big difference. Yeah. Okay. So once you, once you made a decision, a lot of people may not know this, but you excelled as an athlete in, mm-hmm. um, in high school, really before that, really, you know, yeah, in yeah, AAU yeah. circuit and all of that, you know um how did you make the decision between sports and medicine because a lot Mm -hmm. of people may go for quote unquote the shinier thing the more attractive thing of of being an athlete versus you know this long road that we that we take to be physicians so what was it that made medicine a decision for you yeah I think that some of it comes from what I had experienced prior um, from my parents, right? So Mm -hmm. my uncle played in the NFL for a few years. Um, I have other family members that played collegiate basketball, um, you know, that had great careers and things like that. But that that time is finite, right? Like Mm -hmm. uh, it ends at a certain point. So you need, it's not even a backup plan, but you need something else, right? So for me, that was medicine. And I would never say medicine is a backup plan because, as you know, if you're doing it, you got to be full into it, right? Right. Um, but it was something that I was passionate about outside of sports. So even coming up, it was like, okay, you know, cool, like, great, you played good today. Uh, did you get that work done? You know, like, these assignments that you got to get done for school, like, when, when are those coming? Because, you know, you got to test next week, right? So just having that mindset. But I think that when I got to Xavier, what I decided was, you know, I thought about, should I try to walk on, play for the team and stuff like that as far as basketball goes. And I decided not to because I felt like I just wanted to focus on my academics at that point because I saw that as like the long-term trajectory. Um, I saw that as something that could take me for years and years instead of just a finite amount of time. So I think that really when I sat down, I looked at my chances and I was like, well, I'm already excelling as a student and I've been heavily involved in athletics. So imagine what I can do with all this extra time now that I don't have to devote that to my athletics as much. So that's kind of what, that was really when I made the decision just to be, you know, fully academic at that point. Okay. Do you feel like the discipline, because I was talking to Wes about this. I talked to Mm -hmm. Ben about this. The discipline it takes to be an athlete translates. Um, Do you feel like that's something that translates for you? Because I guess it's easier to get up at an 8 a.m when you're used to getting up at 5 a.m. for basketball practice for school, you know? Right, right, 100%. I think that the discipline uh, transfers, and I know those guys have talked about that, and obviously they played at a collegiate level, so they know that better than almost anyone, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we had a pretty intense program in high school where we ended up, you know, doing a lot of circuits. We went to Puerto Rico for a tournament as well. So, you know, we were, we were, had the, 
style of a program that was training us to be college athletes. Um, but those guys are 100% right. The things you learn in sports, not only the um, determination and like, you know, how to be on top of things that translates to life, but also wins and losses, right? How to deal with a win, how to deal with a loss, um, mm -hmm. how to work with a team. All those things are models for life. I think sports is a perfect reflection of life. I was actually just at one of my sister's tournaments this past weekend and, you know, she's on a new team, right? So she had to like overcome that first phase of like feeling the team out, where do I fit in here? And then also like trying to get my shine on at the same time where I'm trying <laughs> not to come off like, all right, I'm doing too much, right? But that's life, right? right. You know, when you start a new job, when you become a resident, it's like, yeah, I have to show that I know certain things, but at the same time, you got to play the long game too. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a perfect model for life. And that's what I really appreciate about sports is how much it translates into your everyday life. Mm -hmm. What about the competitiveness of it? The always wanting to be elite, you know, yeah. uh, always wanting to be that alpha because that's how sports is, mm -hmm. you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's alpha, it's competitive. Um, how do you feel like that mentality helped you um, going through medicine? I think that in medicine, it's similar to sports and for me, at least, I needed a chip on my shoulder, you know, mm -hmm. um, it can be, I was, I was lucky enough to go to an institution at like Morehouse where there was really a camaraderie and people looked out for you, you know, mm -hmm. whether it be your classmates or whether it be the professors, whether it be like the janitors and people that work in the library, right? Like people are looking out for you all the time. That's not how all of medicine is, unfortunately, right? So it helps to have a chip on your shoulder and an adage to the point where you know, like, hey, I can do this and I'm really damn good at this, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to believe in yourself, even when other people don't believe in you, you know? Um, so you have to be your own motivator in a sense. And that's very true with medicine as well, right? Like, you know, everybody's qualified. Everyone's intelligent. Everyone is going to know, you know, 70% of the same thing. What are you going to do to separate yourself? So for me, I, you know, I leaned into my strengths. What's my strength? Talking to people, communicating. So that's why I chose family medicine. So I said, look, this is how I can do the most good with the strengths that I was given. So I leaned into that because I felt like, you know, when I start talking to people, there's no way I won't connect with them on something. We'll find something in common to talk about. Um, and building that relationship helped me build trust. When people trust you, they tell you more. And when they tell you more, you can be a better physician for them. Because I can't help you with your medical issues if I don't know what's going on. And you're not going to tell me that if you don't trust me, right? Like, there has to be a relationship there. And that's why I, you know, really fell in love with family medicine because the relationships that I saw those doctors have with their patients, it felt like they were talking to a family member that they just hadn't seen in a while. It felt like they were catching up, you know, and then the, the patient would tell them certain things that they wouldn't really divulge in another case. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, it just went on and on from there. And that's how they were able to get what they needed from the physician. But just having that relationship, I felt like it, I felt like it was, the thing that made me choose family medicine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think too, is like, it's, it's having that showtime type nature too, you know, mm. because it's one thing to know information, but in medicine, you have to put that on display. <laughs> it's not right. like, exactly. you know, cause it, we've all had that moment where like, you might be talking to a, a intern or a resident or, you know, whatever it is. And you're like, I know mm. that, but for some reason, <laughs> it's just it's not it's coming right now. Right yeah, now. yeah, <laughs> you I know. know, I know. That's, and, and that's I, true, right? Like you have to, yeah. There's a difference between knowing it and then really knowing it, right? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and you you gotta be completely on it, like the back of your hand, right? You really shouldn't even have to think about some things. But then, you know, on the other hand, sometimes you have to say say to people, hey. I'm not 100% sure. Let me do some research and let's figure it out, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's a balance between being honest, but knowing what you're supposed to know at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay. If you had to give the next generation three tips to be successful in medicine, what would they be? Yeah. Number one, I would say be compassionate. I feel like we lack that in medicine as a whole. And I think we're in a transition period where we're trying to work on that. 
Um, but Shout it goes along with what community. I was talking about. Yeah, th- there you go. There you, look, you know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> all right. But, you know, being compassionate, it comes with understanding where people are and trying to meet them there, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that's huge for me. The other thing that I would say is, and I wish I had known this myself earlier on, and I, I caught on at some point, but it really a lot of times is who you know, not what you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, medicine is a network right so the sooner you get plugged into that network the more people can do things for you um, and the more opportunities can be created for you Mm -hmm. so you know networking is awesome and you really have to know the right people and then the last thing is really um, you know it's really grit like at the end of the day Mm -hmm. so you know if people that don't know what that is yeah exactly yeah so I mean for me like Grit, grit is an indomitable spirit, right? To the point where you're not going to let anything stand in your way. You're going to do what you have to do to get where you have to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, whether you need to finesse for that and whether you need to put the work in for that, you have to know what to do at the right time. Mm-hmm. So grit is really not letting anything stand in your way and not making excuses. Um, there's so many things, so many obstacles that are going to come up uh in the medical field and like on your journey to medicine whether it be just you know whether it be passing organic chemistry whether it be you know doing well on the mcat whether it be doing well on step one step two like your clerkships and then you know residency in itself is a whole big hurdle that i'm currently trying to navigate right Mm -hmm. so through all of that you have to have grit you have to have you know the understanding that i will make it through this and i will do what it takes to make it through this even like in the darkest moments you have to know in the back of your mind like i'll make it through and i and i think like having that grit and perseverance is a is an underrated quality and mm-hmm. i think it'll get you much further than just raw intelligence will you know because yeah. the person that just keeps going it's just it's a consistency to it it's every day you know and mm-hmm. um that's something you know you used to tell me first year you used to be like Hey man, don't don't get too high, don't get too low, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like you got you gonna be all right, you know. And I, I yeah, think you gonna be all right, in, man. I think sometimes in those moments, you just need to hear it. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you you know it, but it's different. Somebody telling you that's on the other side of it, you mm-hmm. know. Because a lot of the times, people be trying to give us advice, but they're really not in a position, <laughs> yeah, to give us yeah. advice. <laughs> They like, yeah. and you, you know, you, you love it, okay. but it's like, yeah, Bro, but you don't know, you know, that, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you love them for it though. You do, you do, you, you, do. Do. But you, you do, but you know, like, hey man, like, he don't really know. Like, hey, <laughs> I gotta put this work in or else I won't be okay, you know? Right, right, right. But, it was, but, but you're right though. Um, being able to, like, for me, I, I was never always the person that had the answers like just off Mm -hmm. top right like ready to go i'm not that type of guy right but i Mm -hmm. am the person that will find the answer right like i'll get to it somehow some way i might not know it when you first ask me but i will figure it out and -hmm. then i think that that's what is the thing that separates me because like for me like oh i don't know isn't a good enough response like the response is like i will figure it out and then i'll let you know Mm -hmm. and i think that is the you know for me, that's what gets me through is knowing like, look, I'll figure it out some way, some way somehow. Like, don't worry about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and it's, it's having that problem solving quality, and you know that's that's something that that is definitely important. You have to be able to solve problems because, a, as a physician, you know that's pretty much what you do. You know, people, yeah. people come yeah. in with problems, and you tell them how to solve it and how to manage that yeah. problem. You know, exactly. Um, and medicine is an art too, so you know you don't always. It's not always A to B. Sometimes right. you have to look at a certain person's circumstance and say, hey, look, you know, we could go this way, but with you, I think that it might be best to, you know, do this other route because mm-hmm. you have these other things going on. So there's, there's an element of finesse and problem solving, like you said, that's very intertwined with medicine. Absolutely. Okay. So I know you're, you're, in, a fa- you're in a family medicine rotation right now. Um, mm-hmm. after which you'll complete a fellowship uh, in sports medicine. Um, how mm-hmm. full circle is that for you to be able to like work with athletes, be involved with athletics? Like, what does that mean to you? 
Oh, it's huge. Um, so like you said, I'm in the first year of my residency now, but I ultimately hope to go through and, you know, do sports medicine as a fellowship. And that would be huge. I think that having started and having had such a, a long relationship with sports to be able to, you know, intertwine that and mix that with medicine, it would be full circle. But I think that because I'm passionate about underrepresented minorities in medicine, it's a great avenue to work in that lane, right? So for me, one of the things I've always been interested in is how do we get like the youth to, you know, obviously like it's great to idolize basketball players, football players, hockey players, like, you know, all those professional athletes. But there's less than what a 1% chance of making it to the NBA, right? So how do you take that energy, like your love for sports, and then also turn it into like another avenue which you can have success in as well? So I think that for me, it's really the ability to mentor that will come in with that as well. So like, you know, muscle skeletal systems are great for me. Like I'm passionate about that in terms of medicine, but combining that with the opportunity to be a mentor for the next generation is really, you know, where I see like my career trajectory going in the long run. Mm-hmm. And I, I, another thing that I'm noticing as we're going through this conversation is like your ability to see yourself as a role model, to know, mm-hmm. to know that you're that. You get what I'm saying? Like a lot of people shy away from that at times. You know, they're like, mm-hmm. I'm not no role model. I just, I'm just, you know, <laughs> yeah. you understand that you have a responsibility for one. And yeah. that's also a deed for seeing you know, because where I'm from, it, it don't really have black doctors. <laughs> you right. know, what, you exactly. know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you you know this as well as I do. There were more black doctors in 1960 than there are right now. Like more black men that were doctors. That's, so that's ridiculous. And when, yeah, when you think about the things that were going on in that time, that's a wild fact, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but you're right. I think that people that have the ability to help have the responsibility to help. So. For me, it's like I was able to come from somewhere like Baltimore where, you know, we have politicians that have, you know, tried to disgrace that city before Mm -hmm. um, and people that have like equated it to essentially a third world country before. Right. But, you know, that's the the wire has something to do with it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Okay, that's fair enough. (laughs) But (laughs) beyond that, uh, you know, they're really talented people that come from there right there's talented people that come from all over um and sometimes you just need someone in your corner to kind of like advocate for you for certain things but i've seen people that were just as smart as me that were probably smarter than me or more talented than me and i don't think their potential is like fully utilized now there's a lot of factors for that but I think that one of them is because of how we see people that look like us portrayed, right? Absolutely. Like, like you just said, you, you had never seen like a black doctor growing up, right? Like that was something that was an enigma in certain ways. Right. Um, and I know like my mom, she always had us like our doc, she went like, and she would find like black physicians purposely for us mm-hmm. to like have as kids, like as pediatricians and whatnot. Now I don't remember that. Like, I don't remember my pediatrician, you know, being, african-american and whatnot but the fact that she did that and like at least tried to like instill it in our minds at a young age like that's huge um Mm -hmm. and i think that having those type of people and like understanding that they saw themselves in that position for me i need to now see myself in that position for others Mm -hmm. it's 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 easier to become what you see yeah you you know what i mean it's it's easier you know to become what you see you know and the sad thing is like everybody can't be like a first you know what i mean everybody doesn't yeah. have that type of will inside of them or that type of energy to push themselves beyond you know and i think mm-hmm. a lot of times we do an inadequate job sadly of empowering the next generation a lot of times it's like okay i got mine you know work just as yeah. hard as i did you know that type yeah. of mentality and that yeah. just to me, makes no sense. You know, to me, the will should become more efficient over time. You, you know what yeah. I mean? I would agree with you. I think that that pull yourself up by your bootstraps like mentality. Yeah. Well, how you do that if you don't have no boots? 
right? Right, right. Like, you know, <laughs> like, you know, when you talk about certain things like <laughs> that we weren't afforded in this country at a certain point, like the GI Bill, right? Mm -hmm. Like, we didn't get that, right? Right. Um, so all the benefits that came from that, we don't see that. Or, you know, when it comes to like redlining um, and like, you know, zoning for housing, like those are systemic things put in place so that it's harder for us to succeed. Most so, definitely. you know, and like I said, this is a, that was a pretty deep conversation to a certain extent, but like, it's hard to thrive in a system that wasn't meant for you, right? right so right. we're constantly trying to navigate against something like, you know, you, you have a force coming one way and you have a force navigating like against it versus for other people, you just trying to, you know, move through the meadow, like, it, and it may mm -hmm. or may not be all that difficult. Obviously, there are things that they have to deal with as well, but it feels like for people that look like you and myself, there's always something pushing back against us to get to the next level. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, it, it's just challenges, but we have to do it. You know what I mean? It, yeah. it's, it's, it's something that, that we have to do, you know, in, in order to, to find the type of success that we're looking for, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah and okay. you know success has it looks different ways for different people so for everyone it's not going to be okay become a doctor or a lawyer and or right. whatnot you know it however success looks to that person like they have to find a way to navigate and find mentors and you know do what they need to do to reach their own potential um mm -hmm. because i know we've been talking a lot about like professionalism and whatnot uh but i think it's also important to realize that that's not always the avenue for everyone and you can be tremendous in your own field, whatever it may be, um, but you still are going to face those challenges. Like, you know, nothing is easy, right? Like, they're not going to pay you if it's easy. You're not going to, you know, uh, the accomplishments that you'll have to make are not going to be easy by any means. But, you know, you have to do that to find your own level of success. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Definitely. Okay. What qualities should every good doctor have? What quality should every good doctor have? Mm -hmm. I think every good doctor, one, I, I'll say the same thing for like, that I said with medicine, should be compassionate. I feel like a lot of times when you talk to some physicians, they speak at you instead of talking to, like with you. Mm -hmm. um, and what I mean by that is, as physicians, we know a bunch of complex medical terms, terminologies, physiology, pathophysiology, right? Like we know the intricacies of those things. But when you're talking to a person, like just talk to them in layman's terms. And it's not, I don't think it's disrespectful. I think if anything, it's trying to relay very complex topics to someone that, you know, did not go through the same education that you did and does not have the same degree that you do. So mm -hmm. you have to talk to someone to the level at which they can understand to help them truly make the best decisions for their health. And I think that comes with being compassionate. Um, so I think all good doctors should have that. Also, you have to be, you know, intelligent enough to understand whatever field you're in, right? So that comes with levels of sacrifice um, because, you know, as a medical student, you know this, you miss certain things that come up, whether it be yeah. family events. Yeah, like you, you miss those things, right? And what you're doing is you, you study it for the next test. Like you wish you could be there, um, but you, you know, you have to put that sacrifice to you. So you have to be very intelligent in terms of what it is that you've chosen to go into, like whatever that field may, may be, you have to be on top of that. Whether that be like reading the latest like articles and whatnot, um, and just kind of keeping up with the literature. Um, I think that those are two huge things. And I think that the first one gets overlooked a lot in favor of the second. But I wish that more physicians were compassionate and could actually like speak to their patients on their level. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Because I, I think like with becoming a doctor, sometimes we see they, they it's like almost like a culture of being cold. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like sometimes just not being able to empathize with what a patient's going through. Like you can't just walk in on somebody that, that found out they got cancer. And be like, mm -hmm. yeah, you got cancer two weeks. Yeah, all right. Yeah. And just walk out of there. Right. You can't do that. You know, you right. can, but you know, to me, um, sometimes a doctor is all a patient has to feel comfortable or, mm -hmm. or to feel better about their situation. You know, I've seen how 
people can feel sick and light up when they see a doctor walk in. You yeah. know, that's a that's a that's a real thing. That's a real relationship. And I think that that's something that's been underemphasized is the physician patient relationship. It actually is a relationship. You know what I mean? Yeah. Especially in yeah. feels like primary care and stuff like mm-hmm. that. You're seeing those patients often. <laughs> exactly exactly like you you are their advocate in a lot of times um and what you said is huge right like it is a relationship and i feel like we use that word a lot without actually understanding like its meaning um so you know there's that but also like you said you know me i'm in primary care but i think that one of the great things that i learned at morehouse was that even if you're not in primary care as a physician you should be primarily caring right, right? So it should be your goal to care for others. You could be, you know, like a specialty service and whatnot where you only do one thing, right? But when you do that, like you should still be caring about the patient, even though you're only managing like just one small thing. Um, and that makes all the difference to the patient. That's why patients have such great, you know, and at least like historically have really great relationships with their family docs because they know them so well. You know, mm-hmm. like we have a real relationship. I, you know, I ask you about your husband or your wife or your kids or whatever it may be. Um, and you appreciate those things, even if it's only for like a moment right before we start talking about everything else medical. That mm-hmm. makes a difference to patients. That's definitely, definitely, definitely. Okay. So how do you balance medicine and relationship? Man, that's hard. <laughs> That, that's a that's a hard <laughs> feat. Uh, I'm not gonna lie to you, uh, especially being in a relationship with someone that's also in the medical field, right? Um, that's our time is very limited. Um, so I think that it comes, at least for you know, our relationship, it comes with knowing the other person well and what they respond to well, right? So there are certain things that I'll do that I know make my fiance happy because like that's who she is. And these are things that matter to her versus like me trying to do things that I like that would make me happy for her. Um, I think there's a difference in that. So you got to know your partner when it comes to those relationships. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We, we can't zoom. Yeah, go ahead. It, it explain, uh, right, what that, right. explain what that means. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's kind of like uh, love languages, right? Uh-huh. So, I have to understand what makes her happy. So like if for her, it's like words of affirmation, right? I have to be on my P's and Q's with that for her versus like for me, I think mine is like uh, gifts or like physical touch or something like that, right? So for me, like I would, I would have enjoyed like getting a small gift or something like that, but I can't just give her something because that's what would make me happy. That's not what's gonna make her happy, right? right? So when our time being so limited, I have to know that and I have to like act in accordance with that um, Mm -hmm. as opposed to the opposite. But also like with relationships just with family, right? Like it is tough to maintain family relationships while being in the medical field as well, just because your time is so finite and you get so wrapped in to like what you're doing sometimes that you may, you may see a text from someone be like, okay, like, yeah, I'm going to respond to that in a couple of minutes. And next thing you know, like four hours is going by, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to be very intentional about when you respond to things and, you know, who you choose to spend your time with. So for me, like, I know when I have a free weekend, like, a lot of times I'll go back to Baltimore just to try to, you know, spend some time with family, even if it's only for, like, a day, right? And then I'll come back um, and I'll do what I have to do. I was just talking to one of my uh, senior residents, and he was saying that, you know, him and his wife, they just spontaneously took a trip for a weekend and then then came back. And for them, like, they needed the the getaway, the escape for a second, just to be out of the state and then to come back and feel rejuvenated. So you have to do certain things that will keep you lively and not let medicine bog you down when possible, because, you know, it's a lot. Um, Mm -hmm. There's a reason why we unfortunately have physicians that commit suicide, um, for one reason or another, there's a reason why there's a lot of depression and uh, other psychiatric issues within the medical field as well. So, you know, you have to do things to keep you sane outside of medicine. It's huge and it contributes just to your overall wellness as a person, not only a physician. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. 
And to me, it's like finding that balance can be challenging. But, mm-hmm. you know, if you care about the person enough, you find time, you know, yeah. to, to, to make that balance and to make things work. It's not going to always be perfect. You know, we know that. No, you no, know, no, no. It, it, <laughs> you know, it, it's going to be some arguments, some disagreements along the way. But I think, you know, um, at a very fundamental level, like you were saying, you know, you you learn to love a person in a way that they need to be loved. You know what I mean? So, yeah. That, that's something that's something that's important man that, that's that's some good game all right yeah yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's not that's for free right there you know that's what i got to charge for that's for free. right 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 yeah. okay so what's a motto that you live by that's a really good question man um i think that one of the things that i live by is the saying that i heard when i was in high school um and it goes we are what we repeatedly do mm-hmm. excellence therefore is not an act but a habit Mm -hmm. So what that means to me, at least, is that, you know, you have to continuously not just talk about it, but be about it. Right. So you can't just do something for one time and then be like, okay, like, yeah, like that was it. I did it, you know, X, Y, and Z. Like you really have to, if you're going to do something, you got to do a full force and you have to practice what you preach. So for Mm -hmm. me, like whether that be medicine and just being, you know, like, hey, by any means necessary, I'm going to get to this goal. Like, that's how I look at it. But also it comes in, we just talked about relationships, right? So it comes in like, hey, look, you know, at the end of the day, if this is the person you want to be with, you're going to figure out a way to make it happen. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it really means just like achieving what you say you want by continuously trying to reach that goal and not just stopping or giving up because you hit like a tough time. Mm-hmm. Okay, definitely. And um I think I think that just just the fact that habit is what leads to excellence is something mm-hmm. that isn't because I could look at you post uh the work, you know, mm-hmm. with the with the velvet cap and you know the three bands yeah. on the show, you know, yeah. and, and, and it makes it look like, oh, he effortlessly did that. No, mm-hmm. you know, it's yeah. hours spent in the hospital. It's hours in the library. It's, you know, disagreements with people. It's working with professors. It's a lot contained in yeah. that. And the habits is what got you through, you know? Right. Um, I right. personally know you having that experience of being like, Oh yeah, nah. I knew you were gonna bring that up. Yeah, yeah. I, so I got I gotta tell that story, you know, now that you don't brought it up. So allegedly, um, I was in the library, right? And you know, I think I don't know, I don't remember what test it was. I don't even remember like what I was reading. I think, I think time, it might have been be physics. I think it, it might have been. And it, and you know, if it was physics, I was going in because I struggled with that. Uh-huh. So you know, I'm going in on this assignment and. I see my phone ball and I look at it and it says Jeremy Shropshire on there, you know, and I look at it I do, and then I turn it down and uh, put the phone back to where it was by my book. And I keep reading my book. Lo and behold, Jeremy come up on the side of me about five seconds later talking about, I just saw you ignore my call. <laughs> and at that point you know i couldn't even deny it bro like i was i was just trying to work that's all i was trying to do but you're right like you know i was really in it at that moment mm-hmm. um but you know if you don't see that you'll think that oh well it must have been easier oh well you know they just floated on through and it, it wasn't as hard for them as it is for me right now now nah, mm-hmm. it was it's was just as hard like it's not gonna be easy um and i feel like like you said, we look at people sometimes and we go, man, like I want that right there, but you don't know what it took to get there. What they paid, what they paid. Yeah. You know, and I'll say like that taught me something that I carry today. You know, I'm Mm -hmm. like, you can't let people get in the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, it, I don't have time to be talking right? to you right now. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's my thing. Like, it's not negative. Like, you know, I got a lot of love for you, bro. Like, but at that moment, it was like, all right, well, I got to put this down. Like, I got to choose me. Right yeah, you know, exactly. I, I got to choose me. You know, so. Exactly. You do. You do. I, I learned, you know, that's something that I think is important for everybody to learn. You know, if they don't take anything else away from this conversation. 
is to learn that at 40, at 50, you're going to have to live with those decisions that you make. And you don't want to yeah. look back at your 20s and teens and say, oh, man, my life would be completely different, you know, if if I had approached things differently. My dad always tell me, like, the decisions that you make today has implications way far down the line. You know, yeah. you're, you're going you're gonna to yeah. be the decisions you make now, you're going to be living off those when you're 60, <laughs> you right. know? Right. And I think that that's yeah. something that a lot of kids don't have in view is mm -hmm. their life perspective. You know what I mean? Right. Just, what do you want your life to look like? You know what I mean? Because yeah. if, if you want your life to be, you know, valuable, prosperous, you want to live a long life, you want to have money, resources, kids, you want to mm -hmm. be in their life, it's certain decisions you're not going to be making. You know, you're not going to be right. robbing people, <laughs> shooting mm -hmm. people, you know? It's, it's not, yeah. you're not going to have that type of mentality if you actually view your life in the long term. But the issue is a lot of the younger generation doesn't view their life as long. They view their life as today. So it ain't yeah. nothing for me to make a decision that has lot, has long-term implications if, uh, if I only think I'm going to live to 25. Right, right. You know what I mean? And we talked like, talk about this before, like the most dangerous people are the ones that feel like they got nothing to lose. Nothing right? to lose. Like, you know, so that that comes with that mindset that we were talking about earlier. And I agree with you. It's funny that your dad said that because, and I, I don't think I really ever told you this, but one of the things my dad told me was like, when you become an adult and like the process of becoming an adult and a, like, and a man is that, you make decisions and you live with the consequences, good or bad, mm -hmm. right? So you have to choose and then be okay with, is this a good decision or a bad decision? And what are the consequences of that? And if I can live with that, then go ahead and do it, you know? Yeah. So like for me, like that's kind of how I uh, have modeled my life after, right? Like am I choosing something that's going to uh, likely turn out good or likely turn out bad and can I live with it? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Cause you know, I, I watch force 48, you know, that's one of my favorite shows and mm -hmm. I just see kids, you know, get life for yeah. a 10 minute decision or over something crazy, you know, $50, <laughs> you yeah. know, and, and get a lifetime of imprisonment, you know, yeah. and, and that just shows me, you know, that you, you have to be careful about the decisions that you make. You have to be ultra careful because if you have to protect your future at all costs and sometimes mm -hmm. that's sometimes that means distancing yourself from certain people sometimes yeah. that means foregoing that party or that event because mm -hmm. you know that test you you might have still you know <laughs> right you know right. And, and, I, yeah yeah i'll put it to you this way bro i i, I like my freedom and i'm not doing anything that can have someone <laughs> take it away from me you know right 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 like, so, hey, like there are certain decisions that I will and will not be making just based off that alone. Um, but I, I agree. Definitely. Definitely. Man, this has been great. You know, um, we thank you for stopping by to the Liberators podcast. Uh, did you have any any final words or any final bit of advice for any of the listeners? Yeah, man. Um, well, first off, I'm just thankful for being on here. I know that this episode, like we said earlier, this is a long time in the making. Yeah, it's a long so, time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm appreciative to be on here, man, uh, first of all. But no, nah, I just wanted to say that I actually really appreciate what you are doing, you know, um, this avenue that you've chosen to pursue. Uh, a lot of people aren't doing things like this, and I feel like it's really important that we continue to promote you and your efforts. Mm -hmm. um, and then with, with that being said, also, if you haven't checked out The Black Mind yet, you know, you got to go ahead and get that book, <laughs> check that out. With that being said, I got my copy right behind me over there on the bookshelf. But in all seriousness, man, I, I really appreciate everything that you are doing. And I wanted to let you know that I appreciate your journey. Um, you know, we've been close for a long time. So yeah. some of the things that we talked about here today, like, you know, I've seen you struggle, you've seen me struggle. Um, and I think that I just want to say I'm really proud of you for where you've come and like where you are right now. And I hope that, you know, the podcast like continues to thrive and you continue to put out great content because I think it's something that we really need. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it, man. Uh, yeah. I appreciate it. You know, that's, that's what I'm doing it for. 
uh, you know, because I, I just realized that a lot of the things that I've been able to experience and have access to and to be exposed to, that's not a normal thing. So mm -hmm. what I have to do is you leverage the relationships that I have with people to say, look, this is possible. You want to see a, a, a athlete that became a doctor? Here we go. You, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so th those are the things that are, um, you know, important to me it is being able to, you know, I'm not trying to be a gatekeeper. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not that type of person that's just, oh, I'm a, no, we open it, you know, right. to, exactly. to let people have access. And, and that's the most important yeah. thing to me, man. Um, but what I do want, want to do, um, a lot of, a lot, all of our listeners, you know, I give them the ability to maybe like provide an email or your Instagram or whatever it is, just so that the younger generation or, you know, peers are able to reach out uh, and help you, you know, or even if it's somebody older that sees you and wants them to be a part, wants you to be a part of anything that they have going, um, you know, I want them to be able to have that access to you. Yeah, yeah, man, definitely. Uh, so on Instagram, you can find me at um, underscore, underscore, king dot tuck, P-U-C-K, and then underscore, underscore. So you can definitely find me on there. I'm always, I'm pretty active on Instagram. Um, and then uh, email that I can definitely be reached at is Jason Tucker X, so J A S O N T U C K E R X at gmail.com. Um, for anybody that wants to reach out for any type of reason, I'm always, you know, whether it be someone to help, you know, get me to the next level or someone I can help get to the next level, always looking for that either way, man. So 100% down for that. Definitely. And uh, man, we thank you for stopping by and giving us all of these good gems. And, uh, you know, we look forward to doing it again. And we thank everybody for tuning in to another episode of the Liberatus Podcast.